Uh, very good afternoon, dear friends. So, welcome to this uh, instruction course. Uh, this instruction course is unique, as you may have noticed, because all the speakers are renowned guest faculty. Each one of them are uh, well known, they are well experienced in the areas of expertise, acclaimed speakers, as well as respected teachers. They will be taking us, uh, talking to us on various topics and across the various subspecialties. And I definitely think it will be a very good uh, learning experience for all the practicing ophthalmologists as well as fellows as PG students. So with these few words of introduction, let us now move to the, our uh, scientific session proper. So for the first talk, which is on uh, correcting uh, common uh, lower grades of astigmatism with uh, enhanced monofocal eye wells. And for that, we have uh, with us Dr. Tushar Agarwal. Dr. Tushar Agarwal is a professor of ophthalmology, uh, serving in the cornea, cataract and refractive services department of the RP Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He also holds the post of chairman, National Ophthalmic Surgical Skill Development Center. He is also the office in charge of the National Eye Bank. Over to Dr. Tushar Agarwal. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anoop. Uh, I'll be speaking about uh, um, correction of uh, low astigmatism with enhanced monofocal uh, IOLs. I have no financial interest in the matter. Now, we, enc we encounter astigmatism quite commonly uh, during cataract surgery. It's reported that almost half of our patients will have more than a diopter of astigmatism. And uh, when we take the cutoff as about 1.5 diopters, then about 90% of our patients will fall under this category. Now, why is it important to address astigmatism at the time of surgery? Cataract surgery now being partly a refractive surgery along with the therapeutic surgery. If you leave 0.5 diopters of astigmatism on the table, uh, the patient can still uh, uh, see 20 by 20. However, once we cross this uh, sort of a red line above 0.5 diopters, you start to see a drop in the, in the uh, uncorrected visual acuity. And uh, at, at 1.5 diopters, it uh, drops to 612 or even worse. And this is the reason why we now uh, address astigmatism at the time of cataract surgery itself. Now, there are various uh, treatment modalities which have been described uh, in the past and which are some of them are current as well. Uh, you can do an axis phaco, which is uh, the placing your uh, incision at the steeper axis. Uh, this can take uh, care of around 0.5 diopters of astigmatism, but the predictability is low. Then you have things like arcuate keratotomy and LRIs, which have now again come into vogue uh, with the femtolaser systems. Uh, they can correct higher degrees of astigmatism, but the predictability drops once you cross 1.5 diopters or more. Toric IOLs are the gold standard of management of astigmatism with cataract surgery. You have very reliable results and you can correct very high degrees of astigmatism. Others are uh, staged corneal excimer laser procedures where the patient undergoes cataract surgeries uh, and then later on the astigmatism is treated uh, mostly with PRK. Uh, this is uh, reserved for cases like IOL surprise or where the uh, astigmatism actually sometimes increases after surgery. A big advantage of this procedure is that uh, you can also take care of the surgically induced astigmatism. A couple of words about uh, toric intraocular lenses, as I said, they have very reliable results. However, uh, there are some limitations or some difficulties, uh, like, for example, you do require additional preoperative workups. Uh, you might require uh, extra instrumentation as well. And there are some uh, cases in which the toric IOL implantation may not be feasible at all or may be very challenging. These include patients with very small pupils or corneal opacities. So uh, this idea stems from some anecdotal experience which I had. Uh, we, we, we had to uh, implant an enhanced monofocal lens and not a toric lens in patients with some pre-existing astigmatism. And we found to our surprise that uh, uh, they were seeing quite well even without correction. And then when we reviewed the literature and when we uh, uh, mm, uh, looked at the initial papers regarding the enhanced monofocal or even the EDOF lenses, we found that the authors also had uh, 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 sort of uh, hypothesized that they may have higher astigmatic tolerance. 
and uh, then we tried to sort of work it out backwards. Uh, how does an EDOF or an enhanced monofocal lens, I'm using the terms interchangeably, although technically uh, they are not, but still uh, in a broader sense they are. So a monofocal lens has a very uh, single plane of focus and a multifocal or a trifocal lenses, they have uh, multiple uh, planes. The EDOF lens or the enhanced monofocal lens works more by elongating the plane of focus itself. And if you, if you correlate this with the concept of the astigmatism itself and Strum's conoid, you'll find that the Strum conoid is basically uh, making the area of focus from a plane of focus to an elongated area. And this is exactly what the EDOF lenses counter. So with this uh, uh, hypothesis in mind, we conducted a study in which we uh, recruited uh, 38 patients. Uh, and we chose specifically the astigmatism range of 0 0.75 to 1.5 diopters for the reasons I've highlighted before. And uh, uh, one group underwent standard monofocal IOL implantation, another underwent IHANS uh, IOL, which is uh, enhanced monofocal. Post-operatively, as you can see, the, the binocular UCVA uh, didn't show any uh, uh, difference in the two groups at, at, at three months of follow-up. As expected, the intermediate vision uh, was better in the patients with enhanced monofocal lenses. Now this is how it works. So this is the defocus curve of, of both, the both the patient groups. So what this, this primarily means is that how much of a uh, um, uh, lens different, how much of an additional you know, uh, deviation from their uh, refraction can the patients tolerate while still maintaining their UCVA. And you can find that almost uh, EDOF lenses create a uh, defocus sort of uh, 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 a margin of around 0.5 diopters. This is spherical equivalent. Uh, there was improvement seen in the un uncorrected near visual acuity as well in these patients. The contrast sensitivity was also better. But here is where the results are interesting. If we take the cutoff as 6.9 or better than only half of these patients who had 0.75 to 1.5 diopter the astigmatism improved to 6.9 or better. Well, this is not acceptable. With toric lenses, this percentage goes up to almost 90%. But when we did, did a subgroup analysis where we subdivided the patients into two groups, one below one, one diopter, so essentially meaning that this group had 0.75 to one diopter of astigmatism, and the other group more than one diopter, then we find that the Enhanced monofocal group had almost 85% patients, 6-6 six, six or better, and 86% uh, patients, 6-9 or, or better, compared to only half uh, as seen in monofocal lenses. So this is where the advantage came forth uh, of these lenses uh, uh, um, in this group. And as, as expected, as you can see, that uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about the uniocular uh, uncorrected visual acuity, when we talk about 1 to 1.5 diopters, the percentage of patients having 6-6 six, six or better dropped significantly. So to summarize, if we take the groups, uh, a group of patients with astigmatism of 0.75 to 1.5 diopters, then there is, you cannot expect a significant increase as a whole. However, if you take the patients who have one diopter or less of astigmatism, then you can expect almost 85% of the patients to, to see 6-6 six, six or better. And this is where the advantage of this lens lies. Uh, to conclude, toric lenses remain the standard of care for managing any degrees of astigmatism preoperatively. However, enhanced monofocal lenses can also take care uh, of patients who have one diopter or less of astigmatism. So essentially we are talking about the group of patients who have 0.5 or more but less than one diopter of astigmatism where surgeons, uh, surgeons are in two minds whether to go for a toric IOL or not. This can be a good subgroup of patients where to try enhanced monofocal lenses. Thank you. Any questions, I'll be happy to take. Uh, thank you, sir. So um, this is quite a, this is a study which you have yes, yes, done. Yes, in, uh, yes. Okay. So in these cases, when you used eye hands, when you found the vision is good, uh, did you place the section at the steep meridian? No, so we didn't modify the, the, the incisions at all. All cases were done, done temporarily. We, uh, we didn't sort of take care into consideration the access FACO or anything. So I would assume it's about 50-50, the, the distribution. So probably then I think uh, that's a very good thing because a very simple so, way of so, uh, so managing. So this is, a, this is a tricky subgroup, you know, 0.5 
uh, adapters are more, you know, the machine can say sometimes if you're talking about uh, things like uh, IQ and all, so T2 lens is the, the, the first lens which comes up. And some people, you know, some, sometimes, you know, you may not feel, okay, you know, you can get away with it or something like that. So 0.5 to 1 adapters, I think, is a very good uh, area to target. Uh, you, of course, you get the additional benefit of having good intermediate visual as well, good, better near vision as well. And on top of it, you get, it's, it's like a free add-on that you get, uh, you know, good uh, UCVA in these patients. Especially, and, and even, if the, even if you have both the choices, I think there are a still a smaller subgroup where uh, these lenses are not feasible, you know, 100%. Uh, like I said, when the pupil is very small, IFS type of cases, under topical anesthesia, it's not possible to retract the iris. So in those iffy type of cases also, I think it's a good choice if the astigmatism is up to one dap, rather than a monofocal. Thank you, Dr. Trisha. Yeah. I call upon Dr. Anup to give away the momentum to Dr. Tushar Agarwal. The next topic is on wide field fundus photography, a boon for the competency of ophthalmologist. And the speaker is none other than our chairman of the academic Prashant Bhavankule. You may all be very familiar with him since he has recently been elected to this post. Still a few, few words of introduction are in order. Dr. Prashant is the director of Sarakshi Netrale, Nagpur. He is also the honorary associate professor of, at the Indira Gandhi Medical College, Nagpur. He is basically a vitreoretinal surgeon by profession and uh, having done his fellowship from Shankar Netralai. But he is quite adept in anterior segment as well as trauma surgery also. He has held various posts like President of the Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society, the Vidarbha Ophthalmic Society, Treasurer of the VRSI, OTSI. He has also won various awards, which I am not enumerating here. He seems to like adopting new technology. He was the one of the pioneers of 3D assisted surgery and now wide field fundus photography. Over to Dr. Prashant. Thank you, th thank you Dr. Uh, Arup for this wonderful introduction and thank you KSOS for this wonderful opportunity. It's my fourth visit to KSOS and Trisuri in proper uh, to be specific and I had the opportunity to have a Guru Vayur Darshan early in the morning. So, uh, now back to my topic, I would be speaking upon the value of white field imaging, how it can change our diagnosis and all. How do I read? Okay. So, these are the various options which are available in market today, where you can see the field of degree can vary from 135, 163 degree. On an average, the normal fundus photograph, uh, on a fundus camera, you get, see a view of only 35 to 40 degrees. And if you add a 7 field, you can see up to 70 degrees, not beyond the equator. And aura to aura, the dimension is almost 220 degree. It means we are just seeing one, one third of the retina and based on that we are presuming our diagnosis to be based upon. It. So that is the reason we, with this new toy we can think something different and it can challenge the way we look at a particular disease. First we'll talk about the wide field OCT. In a standard field you see a scan width of about 9 to 12 millimeter length rather I should say. And in a white field, you can see up to 16 millimeter. And now we have a technology where you can have a scan OCT right from aura to aura as big as this. And it offers you especially when you have a concomitant pathology as well as extramacular pathologies. These are some of the books, pictures. I will just come to my particular case. She's a 80 years old mother of a pathologist who complained of decreased vision. And this was the fundus photograph. As you can see in a white field photograph, you have a wide a lesion in the temporal periphery, which is a peripheral PCV and this was the OCT in fact you can uh, OCT where you can see a lesion can we have a pointer over here how do I use it to point it so it was if you see in the upper part there was you can see some fluid creeping into the macula so in the old OCT you could just pick up the central part while with the white field OCT you can go through the lesion actually you can see how the lesion is behaving and basically then we started treating it with a prolusizumab uh, and you can monitor actually the even the peripheral lesion how it is decreasing uh, with time and responding to our treatment or not. So this is one of the examples of white field OCT. 
Now this is a patient who was diagnosed as an epiretinal membrane and advised vitreous surgery elsewhere. And you can see in this particular picture when you have a white field OCT, you can not only see epiretinal membrane here, but this is the reason means it has a concomitant other pathology in the form of a proliferative uh, uh, fibrous tissue over there. And this was what we got on a white field OCT. If proper scans were taken, you could see that membrane was leaching here leading to lamellar hole. And this is how it changed the way we look at it. Now this is another patient who had a normal OCT presumably and this I probably we thought we are seeing something abnormal. But on a white field OCT you can see there is a simultaneous, uh, 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 you are having a peripapillary skysis as well. So this is how a complete panoramic view helps you in better diagnosis. Now for diabetic retinopathy which is the commonest indication for doing various uh, fundus photography or angiography you can actually quantify the areas of non-perfusion and you can do what is called a targeted laser therapy. Now let's see this particular patient advised as macular edema and advised anti-VEGF elsewhere. She is a diabetic 91 and he is a diabetic 9, nine years old. Diabetic and complaint of decreased vision. And when we do a wide field OCT, you can see the skytic cavities are extending much beyond the central FAZ and it changed our diagnosis to retinoskysis with a concomitant macular edema. So it was not a diabetic macular edema, but the patient complained of progressive loss of vision. In a retinoskysis, visual loss is expected, macular edema is known. Why was it progressive in nature? We did an angiogram, and we, when we did an angiogram for this particular patient, as you can see in a white field angiogram, you can see a telegenetic response in the extreme periphery which can never uh, have been picked up on a standard photograph because in a standard angiogram, you, this is the area of visibility. So we had to treat her with laser this area as well as with anti phagef and it explained why this patient had a progressive loss of pay, uh, vision in this particular case. Now look at another case. This is a patient who was diagnosed to have retinal detachment. I thought I am seeing some fibrous tissue over here. When I looked at the peripheral fundus of the other eye, which was asymptomatic, I saw some fibrous tissue. I was not ready to accept the diagnosis of simple detachment. And when we did a white field angiogram, you can see a FEVR in both the eyes. So what it helped me in changing my diagnosis, I first treated this eye with a laser and averted a disaster which had already precipitated in the left eye. Of course, we operated the left eye with vitreous surgery. Otherwise, a partial detachment, we could have even thought of about our buckle. Now this is post-op for the left eye. Now this is another case, 52 years female, diabetic, hypertensive, and this is for floaters. Patient was diagnosed to have epiretinal membrane advised vitreous surgery, but when we look at a white field photograph, I thought there is a pull, pulling up of the blood vessels over here. And when we did a white field photograph, you can see there was again a case of a FEVR. This is post-operative photograph. So we did vitres, uh, vitrectomy, endolaser, and this is the uh, Ozodrex implant which was placed here. So this is how it changes your way. This is 48 years male who had hypercholesteremia since 7 years and this was what diagnosed as a rot spot elsewhere and advised simple angiography. When we did a white field angiography you can see a shutdown in the extreme periphery. Usually on a standard photograph you would have picked up and you would have missed out this peripheral. So in this particular case, we just did a targeted laser in the extreme periphery, quite anterior to the equator, and we could salvage the peri uh, po uh, field of vision, posterior field of vision. So this is what we see on a white field angiogram. Bilaterally, the disease was there. So, th so this was peripheral vascular occlusion. This is another case where you can see multiple sclerosis vessel in this eye and patient when we did a white field and had a lamellar hole over here on a white field OCT. And you can see in half zone disease in a case of an elderly. Usually half zone disease is a terminology which we use in a case of a ROP. This is what we have sent for present uh, uh, publication, half zone disease. And this patient had a bilateral carotid disease. Now another case, 26 years female, Montux positive, and this is what she came with. This was a healed case of uveitis when she was complaining of progressive loss of vision. We could not explain why was there a progressive loss of vision. We did an angiogram in this particular case and we could see the peripheral dropout in this particular case. So this was a case of a peripheral vascular ischemia in the periphery in a case of a healed uveitis. We just did a peripheral laser and it responded to our treatment. Yeah. 
So another case of a similar, a similar case of a choroiditis had a vitreous hemorrhage. We did a white field angiogram. You could see a vascular response in the extreme periphery, which needed just a targeted laser in extreme periphery. This is how, and we could spare the posterior pole, so the patient's field of vision was not affected. Now this patient girl was diagnosed as a Eels disease and advised vitrectomy for this particular patient. Yes, of course, she had a proliferative vascular retinopathy with a combi uh, combined retina detachment. But when I looked at the other eye, I, th I thought I'm seeing something different. It was pruning of the vessels. For the sake of postgraduate, this is co classically called the pruning of the blood vessels. And when we did a white field angiogram, we could pick up a case like this in a better eye. So we treated the better eye first, which was asymptomatic by laser and averted a disaster. Of course, the other eye underwent a vitreous surgery and was treated whatever necessary. Now, this patient has another, another two, one minute, sir. Thysicle following right eye, thysicle uh, eye because of operated, this was the history which was significant and this was the patient's fundus photograph. Even to the best of the eyes, I thought this fundus photograph was normal. But I, I had to trust this particular part. It was creating an index of suspicion for me. So I did say that to do a fundus fluorescent angiography and look at what I could pick up. Multiple vascular tumors in the periphery, which cannot be picked up on a standard fundus photograph. So this was a case of a VHL. We treated here uh, the patient with the laser. Now, post-treatment follow-up can be also well done. Now, father was asymptomatic. We decided because it can have a genetic link. We did a white field angiography. Again, you could see multiple angiomas in his eye. Similar was the case with her asymptomatic brother where we could pick up multiple lesions in the, with a the white field angiogram. Of course, we went ahead with the genetic and all other studies, treated him. And in this case, especially for the sake of postgraduates, you have to repeat one yearly white field angiography to see for any recurrence. We did a genetic study and we could identify the gene in this particular case. Now, this is a case of C, uh, CSR diagnosed elsewhere, but when we saw the picture in a white field OCT, we were not convinced, and this was a case of a VKH. Uh, I would just, just run through this presentation now. There are multiple such cases. This is again the multiple blisters which I can pick up on this uh, case of a white field photograph. And uh, this patient was diagnosed to have a night blindness uh, and uh, was diagnosed to have macular edema, rather retinal edema in one eye. When we did an angiogram, it, this is a case of simultaneous retinitis pigmentosa with CRAO. So I will just sum up my case over here that many a times, as I said, in a white field angio uh, imaging techniques, you visualize almost 220 degrees and this is possible with this newer technologies. Previously, with the standard for the fundus cameras, we can only visualize the central 170 degrees or maximum 80 degrees and it challenged us the way we are looking at the disease and it can definitely modify the treatment and give us a better clue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Like, like wonderful photographs, really. Yeah. So, I mean, like you have re really illustrated the use of this particular technology to pick up so many cases which could have been missed otherwise. Yes. Yeah. But I think uh, uh, the, what would be the cost of that would be a I mean, the only, uh, yeah, cost is prohibitive. It is, it comes in uh, six, so, seven digit, I should say. Uh, but uh, what we miss in uh, in yeah. this case is it's a passion. If you are looking, at, if you are a, a predominantly a retina surgeon and who wants to pick up things and go for publication. In fact, my slide last slide was the amount of the publications. We have about ten cover pages, all contribution, and that is what I call return on investment for my investment, which I've done with this machine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I uh, request uh, Dr. Tushar, can you give the memento to Dr. Prashant? Uh, next, uh, the next topic is on the diagnostic evaluation of open angle glaucoma in the present scenario. And the speaker is Dr. Andrew Braganza. Dr. Andrew Braganza is a professor of ophthalmology. We all know him very well, CMC Vellur. He has spent uh, most of his medical career at CMC, right from his MBBS, except probably for a few years when he uh, did his MS at PGI Chandigarh. He is a doyen in the field of glaucoma. We all know that. But he has also done a lot of good work in strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology. 
He is a teacher par excellence and an examiner for undergraduates and postgraduate students in ophthalmology in the states of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Pondicherry, Karnataka, and also for DPNB. Dr. Andrew Brickens. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, the KSOS for inviting me. I love coming here, mainly because of the food. But uh, the scientific content of this conference uh, I have found admirable and the way it's organized. So it's a pleasure to be here. Anyway, so when I was, you know, just doing my post-graduation, diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma was a three-legged stool and it was IOP, disc and fields. And if you have three legs, then you can create a stool and you can sit on it and it will bear a whole lot of weight. It's still the same, but the terminology has changed a bit. So IOP is IOP, but now we have functional tests and structural tests, but we still have only three legs to stand on. If we go into the details of each of these legs, um, it's not that things have stayed still. You know, we've got become more and more uh, technologically aware, we have technologies which have been applied to make us more accurate in how we measure each of these, uh, the parameters that we measure to help us to our diagnosis. So in IOP, Goldman Applanation Tonometer was and still is the gold standard and it must be measured in every patient. Having said that, even though Goldman is likely to continue as the gold standard for some time, we have found the need to try and monitor intraocular pressure at various times of the day, uh, in various other situations. Uh, so there are many other tonometers. And uh, to my mind, one of the best is the dynamic contour uh, tonometer because that uh, take, you know, takes the corneal thickness out of the equation. And uh, you know, the rebound tonometer, eye care, and uh, there are several other devices Interestingly, there are also devices where you can measure intraocular pressure through the eyelid. Accuracy and all that, okay, but there are patients in whom, you know, other means of measurements are not possible, and measuring through the eyelid offers a safe way for the patient to monitor their own intraocular pressure if you can figure out what sort of correction you have to um, apply. The latest is a contact lens sensor where you can continuously monitor the intraocular pressure and it's kind of passing it onto a device which will pick up all this information and that's very promising. Does the Shiot stenometer still have a role? Uh, surprisingly, it possibly does because it's one of the only ways you can clinically measure intraocular pressure after a keratoprosthesis. So, use the Shiot stenometer on the inferior sclera and you get some indication of the intraocular pressure. So don't uh, completely count it out of the picture. The role of intraocular pressure in diagnosis of primary angle closure glaucoma is based on the fact that we have time and time again proved that it is causally associated. Uh, we know about all the inaccuracies in measurements, etc., and we can correct for them. We know that there's a great individual variation of normal IOP, which is why it's so difficult to diagnose glaucoma in the first place. We know that the fluctuations in intraocular pressure can affect the diagnosis and the treatment. About 40% of primary open angle glaucomas at their first presentation have a normal intraocular pressure. So uh, we need to get a little more information about that. And we used to do a lot of diurnal variations of intraocular pressure, uh, which we don't do anymore, not because it's a valueless test, but because it's so cumbersome and difficult to do, time consuming, uh, resource consuming. And by resource, I don't mean um, financial resources. It takes up our time. And we need to have enough people to do that. So continuous monitoring of intraocular pressure, et cetera, is likely to contribute a lot in uh, the diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma in the future. We have functional tests also. So full threshold automated static, uh, uh, static automated perimetry is the gold standard, but it's a psychophysical test. And a psychophysical test needs an intelligent cooperative subject. They have to understand what's required of them and they have to perform. It also has statistical interpretation, which means that the more data that we have, 
the better we can get, the better sort of result we can get, which means every decision has to be made on at least two uh, visual fields. Okay, that's the recommendation, the strong recommendation from all glaucoma authorities. We don't always do it, but that's the recommendation. Uh, FTP has been used. It's a different, slightly different modality. And uh, in children and patients who are unable to perform automated perimetry, it can help in the diagnosis. When you can't do any of this, then you do careful combined manual static and kinetic perimetry. And uh, again, very time consuming and resource consuming. So why do we need to test function? Okay, why can't we just say, okay, I, you know, disc looks like this and that's it. That's because there's a wide interpretation of uh, structural tests. So, you know, the functional test becomes very important. We often see patients in whom the most sophisticated imaging is abnormal, but this is not reflected in the fields that we test. When we commit to primary open angle glaucoma treatment, we commit the patient to, for, to treatment for life. And that means to potential serious adverse effects, uh, which can be medical, uh, you know, because of medical treatment, can be because of surgical treatment, because we say, okay, I have to reduce your intraocular pressure by 30% or 35% or whatever, according to my other studies. Uh, we will have to operate. And the TRAB is not an easy operation, nor are any of the other, uh, you know, uh, devices that we use easy operations or without complications. And even laser treatment has its problems. So the functional aspect is the weakest leg of the stool. We desperately need an objective measure of function. And the possible candidates for this are really electrophysiology based, where you can use ERG, you can use pattern ERG, which is OK. Uh, you can use multifocal ERG, which is really not proving to be very useful. And you can use this uh, you know, photopic uh, negative response, which is probably better than the other you can also use a VEP-based um, objective visual field testing, and all these are being developed but are nowhere near clinical use for us yet. A nice wrinkle on the standard automated perimetry is the virtual reality-based, uh, you know, head-worn, uh, sorry, I'm really taking up a lot of time, um, uh, perimeters, and these are possibly more reliable. When we come to structural tests, we have the clinical binocular magnified stereoscopic disc examination as our gold standard. Stereoscopic disc photographs reflect this but give us a permanent documentation. We have disc imaging with multiple uh, modalities but finally comes down to OCT, OCT and OCT. Most of the others are not really very much used now because OCT is a very flexible uh, machine and everybody has it. Ocular blood flow, yes, plus minus. The important thing about OCT is that instead of just looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, which is what we do right now, we also have minimum rim width and thickness. We have the GCC analysis, which has been fairly promising, but most promising to my mind is the OCT-based, OCTA-based uh, blood flow. And the question in this is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And the, currently the evidence is that we are leaning towards a more vascular cause mechanism of damage in glaucoma than structural damage. Is there a fourth leg? That's the big question. And there are many candidates, but to my mind, the best candidate is a genetic association. There's a huge amount of work going on in genes, and we are already aware of family history, race, all these as risk factors. Gene analysis is now widespread, and several new genes have been identified. Polygenic risk analysis may be of use in diagnosis. It is definitely of use in making treatment decisions. And I'm hopeful that we will be able to look for expressions of uh, genetic anomalies, which will give us a diagnosis. Um, we leave this out. There's no single stand gold standard for primary open angle glaucoma diagnosis. So what do we do? We continue with our three-legged stool, but make every effort to refine the quality of data that you put in objectively evaluate each new technology that comes and keep our minds open and receptive to change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just a momento. Yeah. Yeah. I request Dr. Prashant to kindly please.
do at the moment. I wish there had been more uh, postgraduates and fellows because it was such a basic class. It was so good actually. I think many of them missed it. Thank you, sir. The topic is uh, on diagnostic evaluation of angle closure glaucoma in the present scenario, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Ronnie George. Dr. Ronnie George is also quite well known to us in Kerala as he is a regular uh, invited faculty at many of our conferences. He is presently the director, Glaucoma Services at Shankar Netralia. He is a professor at the Elite School of Optometry. He is the director of research, Medical and Res Vision Research Foundation, Chennai. Uh, <coughs> thank you, and once again, thank KSOS for the kind invitation. So I'll be talking about uh, the other stool, not the three-legged one, the other stool, which is angle closure glaucoma. And the reason why this question comes up again and again is because there are lots of technology now which assesses the angle. And does this in any way help the way that we uh, have started looking differently at angle closure glaucoma? When we look at angle closure glaucoma, the one thing that is, uh, the, the other two legs of the stool stay the same, the IOP is the same, the optic disc and your functional tests are the same. The only different thing is the angle, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. So the anterior segment OCT is now with us for about 20 years. And we still wonder how we're going to use it in angle closure. And the primary reason for this is because it hugely overcalls angle closure. A huge bunch of normal patients also come up with having angle closure on an ASOCT. What we use it for now is this lens vault. So if you see a large lens vault like this, that can help you to decide what, which uh, eyes will benefit from a lens extraction in addition to any other thing that you want to do for for angle closure. The problem is that we don't really have well-defined cutoffs for this, but this is an additional piece of information that you can use. In fact, this paper that looked at uh, angle closure versus normals had an almost 600 micron difference in lens vault between the two groups. So this is what I was talking to you in terms of it overcalling angle closure. It correctly identified almost all patients who had narrow angles on gonioscopy, but it diagnosed 50% of those who had open angles on gonioscopy as narrow, and which is why we don't use it uh, routinely in the clinic. What happens if you improve technology, if you improve the resolution of the image? So what you do over here is angle-to-angle -angle scan with a high-definition OCT. And with a high-definition OCT, you can see that you get much better images. Does this help? And when you look at the both the uh, area under curves, very similar. So improving technology also did not seem to really help very much with uh, the diagnostic ability of these two tests. What about agreement between the tests? If you look at the agreement between gonioscopy and OCT, we already spoke about it. But if you look at the agreement between Vesante and Cirrus, you still don't get complete agreement. And that's because these are all based on individual slices that you're taking. And angle closure based on a single slice, if you have a little iris bump there, might look narrow in one angle, but might look open in another slice. So that is the reason for this difference. What about image analysis? Can you use image analysis to help you do this? And what you can do is the segmentation and quantification of these images. And with the segmentation and quantification of the images, you do find that this is, they use uh, basically artificial intelligence to do it. You find much better area under the curves. So with this area under the curves, maybe once you bring AI also into the picture, you may actually land up with something a little better. The next OCT that you have is basically the swept source. So with the swept source OCT, you actually now scan the entire angle. You're not taking slices. And this is how, how we do gonioscopy, and this should actually do better than you do with just standard slices. So when you look at the open versus angle closure here, you can see that most points on this graph are open. And you see this sort of a graphic there, which shows you that these are the places which are a little dodgy. And this is a closed angle. And here you're seeing that the entire uh, angle is looking close. So this quantifies the degree of closure. And this is actually something that's fairly useful. But uh, it has some challenges, which I'll come to a little later. Surprisingly, even this doesn't do exceptionally well versus gonioscopy. It does about the same as what the ASOCT does. 
here again, all the SOCTs, this is the issue. Your information you get is from the slice from which it was taken. You cannot assess PAS or pigment, et cetera. The next thing that people came out with was with the iCam. The iCam is basically a modification of the red cam to take pictures of the angle. And it's very nice in congenital glaucoma when you want to document what the angle looks like. In terms of angle closure, because you still have light issues, it can be a problem. When they looked at iCam and ASOCT, they actually found that um, it was marginally better than the ASOCT in detecting angle closure. That's mostly because the specificity was better, not so much because the sensitivity was better. So this, uh, now we are all moving to the era of angle surgeries. And with angle surgeries, where everybody is worried about what is actually going on in the trabecular meshwork, what's happening in the outflow challenge. So you have this uh, experimental device which managed to image the trap meshwork to a theoretical resolution of five microns. And this is what you're seeing. So these are actually porcine eye images. And you can see fairly reasonable uh, resolution achieved in porcine eyes. It's still a way away from the clinic but we may be reaching there sometime soon. So the innovations in angle closure, they've helped us to better understand disease, but they don't really have adequate diagnostic def uh, accuracy for us to use them for detecting angle closure glaucoma. Improvements in circumferential scanning will provide uh, help. So to summarize, right now, with gonia photographs, we don't know about occludability, and light is an issue. With ASOCT, we don't know about Sinike, and that becomes a problem. And with the swept source ASOCT, we don't know about pigment. So currently, even today, gonioscopy, because you can still get information of occludability, indentation, and pigment, is still the gold standard for how we manage angle closure. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Rani. I request Dr. Jyoti to please give a memento to Dr. Rani. Now the uh, topics have been covered. The next we have is a, a panel discussion on uh, Trisoft. That is a new drug, a triple combination drug which has come for glaucoma. So um, I would uh, request Dr. Andrew sir to give his opinion about that. Well, uh, I think it's a much needed combination. Uh, we all know that compliance uh, and adherence issues in glaucoma are very, very big as far as the treatment is concerned in medical treatment. And uh, quite often in our practice in our country, we make surgical decisions because the patients are not compliant enough with the medical treatment. Having a single, having three drugs in a single drop uh, with a frequency of twice a day application would make it much, much simpler for the patient. So that's the reason for having a combination like this. Does it work? Well, the preliminary studies done by the company show that it does work. We'll have to get a lot more information to confirm that. But on the face of it, it looks as if it's a rational combination and it's a useful combination. I think, uh, uh, I mean, I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Andrew has said. But in addition, one big advantage that you have is the preservative load is significantly less. Because if you're going to be using these medications independently, you're going to be putting that much more of BAK into the eye. So now with one drop two times a day, you are potentially eliminating six other, I mean, that's versus six or at, or at least four drops a day. So that's a big advantage. The other, and. Uh, in fact, when you look at the, the data that the uh, company presents, you actually find a fairly good reduction in intraocular pressure once they switch to the combination. In fact, the reduction is more than what you expect. 
and we suspect that some of that may have been relate, related to compliance because somebody was putting four drops or six drops is now suddenly putting two drops, much easier to do. So I think that's going to be the big thing going forward in terms of compliance and the, it's because it's kinder on the ocular surface. So today if you use a combination with three drugs and you use a prostaglandin with three drops a day, you can actually be using four medications. So potentially there is a, uh, I mean it is a, a, a value, there's huge value addition here. A slightly different combination went through DCGI trials about 10 years back and it was, just, it did not go through all because of, I mean, of various reasons, but that also showed good potential. So it's not that, I mean, glaucoma for us, if you can get the patient, or if you can manage to give five drops in one medication, we'll be very happy because patients are likely to use it. And that's what's the most important uh, advantage of the, tri of the combination, I think. So, uh, do you have personal experience in uh, using this particular drug? Yeah, I have used it on a few, uh, uh, see, since uh, the drug is out for less than uh, maybe just about a couple of months, um, we don't have long-term follow-up, but at least on the patients that I have used to, it does seem to work. It's not that it's working less than what they were on before. It does seem to work and patients are fairly comfortable. I have really not um, heard of any new complaints with it. It's too early for me to give you any detailed clinical experience because with two drugs, normally if I'd start the combination, I'd call them back in a month. So it's just a handful of patients. But no serious issues so far and it seems to do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I have exactly the same experience. Uh, again, a handful of patients. The uh, results I report is just completely anecdotal. But nobody has run into any major problems as far as adverse effects is concerned. Efficacy does seem to be good in those patients on whom I've tried it. Uh, so we just have to wait for enough data to come. Are you saying there is some study? It was done by the company itself or some institute? No, there was a multicentric study done by the company. We were also part of it. There were almost uh, 16 to 18 hospitals. The problem was it was started pre-COVID and got stuck during COVID. So because of that, there was a long time to finish the study. I think the results were presented at Academy this year. So when you look at the results, it shows a fairly substantial reduction once you add on the third medication. And uh, again, no serious adverse events. I don't think there was any serious discontinuation. And um, most patients tolerated it pretty well. In fact, patient response, uh, patient preference was quite significant with uh, the drug. I think uh, these combinations, if it worked, then that would be probably uh, a boon for the patient because like we all experience in glaucoma, the more the number of drugs, lesser the compliance. And it's really practically difficult because even on personal experience, some medication, even for five days, we are not able to take properly. So forget lifelong. Absolutely. And there's also a cost advantage because the triple combination actually costs substantially less than using the drug separately. I mean, the company's costs in manufacturing, the whole thing, packaging, distributing, everything becomes, becomes so much simpler because uh, it's a combination. And uh, even, if they, even if they do, uh, you know, switch to a preservative-free uh, kind of preparation, which has uh, some kind of device attached to the bottle which delivers uh, the drug without allowing air into it and whatever it is, even the cost of that is probably uh, not going to be excessively high. All these technologies are now available. So, uh, thank you. If anybody has any doubts, yeah. Um, sir, this uh, now in the last one or two years, a lot of preservative-free options have come into the market. Even I think the Trisoft also, the Monosoft and, and, and their uh, Dorazolamide with Timolol, they plan to come with preservative-free. So, in your experience, what do you feel, uh, is there any difference between these preservative-free options and the ones with preservative in terms of IOP control? Uh, in terms of IOP control, no but I don't have enough experience over a long period of time to comment about the effect of preservatives on the, um, you know, on the effect, on the, the success of surgery, which is what the main concern is when we have a lot of preservatives applied over a long time in the eye. Um, we've not had preservative-free medications to use for a very long time, so no personal experience with that, but what the literature does suggest, strongly suggest, is that going preservative-free is the best way. 
So it doesn't make a difference in IOP control apart from using lower strength, uh, you know, bimetoprost. But uh, even that, plus minus. Repasodil in uh, fuchs endothelial dystrophy, like any experience? Yes, so the use of the ROC inhibitors for fuchs endothelial dystrophy. See, actually, the, the molecule is being tested, or something very similar to it, it is being tested in, the, uh, in Japan. Most of the reports that you have out of Japan are anecdotal, few small short case series. And um, there, are, there is a trial going on, we'll have to wait for that, but what you sometimes see, Somebody who has some issues on the cornea, when you use it, you get this reticulate epitheliopathy. Yes. Hmm. And once you stop it, it goes away. So that is an issue. So this is also compromised corneas. When you use it, it actually causes the edema, not really a resolution. But the few studies are ongoing. We'll have to wait for the results to come out. It is only post-op? Post-op? No, not no. only post-op. Before. Can, before it's, it's, How long you have to continue? You have to continue it. In fact, I think they're looking at six months or one year of use to see what happens. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I also have something to say about that because uh, uh, actually uh, in Brazil, what they are doing uh, is to actually just do the DVEC, which is sort of, you know, do a decimase uh, strip in the center and no, uh, no graft just use Ripasodal about six times a day and in uh, 12 weeks to six months uh, you get clear corneas and of course the results are anecdotal. This guy uh, Ricardo Figuera I think is the one who's done all this and uh, I, when I was there I actually watched one of these procedures and I saw some of the patients who had been previously treated. and. Uh, Corneas looked absolutely clear, but in the presentation that was made, it was made very, very clear that you should be careful in your patient selection. You must choose patients with fairly gross central corneal gutte, but fairly normal peripheral cornea, uh, corneal endothelium. And uh, that means you have to choose patients at a, an earlier stage of fuchs uh, than when we would normally say, okay, now we have to intervene, things are so bad. The reasons that we usually say we have to intervene now and because things are so bad is because the intervention itself is not, you know, 100% cure of the whole thing and uh, you can have problems recurring after that. So, um, as far as this is, you know, the corneal effects are concerned, I think that rock inhibitors are definitely going to be useful. Uh, interesting things are also there with the ROC inhibitors like uh, effects on the sclera and people have, uh, you know, generated some novel ideas about trying to reduce uh, or prevent myopia in children by the effects the, the, of, of these agents on the sclera. All this is very experimental but it's exciting thinking to think that medically we can do this sort of stuff and, uh, you know, uh, affect the growth of the eye, the modulation of various things within the eye, which we thought was impossible before. Any other doubts for the other topics? No. Then I think we'll… Thank you so much. I think we'll have a group photograph. Huh?